Hi everyone, this is Samantha Rose Hill and I am the author of Hana Arendt. I am a senior fellow at the Hana Arendt Center for Politics and Humanities at Bard College and associate faculty at the Brooklyn Institute for Social Research in New York City. And you can find my work at my website, www.samantharosehill.com. So today I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit about Hana Arendt. Who was Hana Arendt? And why has she reappeared in the 21st century as a thinker that we're reaching to, to try to understand the crises of liberal democracy today? So Hannah Arendt was born in Linden, Hanover, Germany in 1906 to a well-established German Jewish secular family. At the age of three, she moved to Konigsberg so that her father's syphilis could be treated. He had contracted acted syphilis before he met her mother, Martha Cohen. Uh, but by the time Hannah Arendt was born, his health was already in steady decline. And when Arendt was just seven years old, he died. This was one of the first major disruptions in Hannah Arendt's life. She became very quiet, introverted, melancholic. She spent hours in her father's library reading everything that she could get her hands on. She faked all manner of illnesses to avoid going to school so that she could stay home with her mother. But her life wasn't quiet for long. It was disrupted again with the outbreak of World War I when Arendt and her mother were forced to flee to Berlin to live with Martha's sister. This didn't sit well with Arendt and she began skipping school, spending more time at home and rebelling within the family. When they moved back to Konigsberg a year later, eventually Arendt was kicked out of high school for leading a protest against one of her teachers. She liked to sneak away in the middle of the night uh, to go visit her friends. Uh, and she was always a bit of a loner, a rebel, a pariah, and as she would later come to say, an outlaw. When Arendt was just 18 years old, she went to the University of Marburg to study with the German existentialist thinker, Martin Heidegger. After their first meeting together, Heidegger wrote to Arendt and said, you must come to me forever. From now on, we will be in one another's lives. They had what has become a rather famous love affair that lasted for about a year until Arendt ended it. Arendt was fortunate enough to study with the two great German fathers, of existentialism, Martin Heidegger and Karl Jaspers. She went to the University of Heidelberg where she wrote her dissertation on the concepts of love and St. Augustine under the direction of Karl Jaspers. Whereas thinking for Heidegger had been a lonely activity that people do by themselves, preferably in the forest, isolated away from the rest of the world. In Heidelberg with the Aspers, Arendt found a conception of thinking that was worldly, that turned people toward conversation, where plurality was at the heart of human connection and politics. In 1929, after Arendt published her dissertation on love in St. Augustine at the age of 23, she moved to Berlin to become a journalist. She was starting to work on her second book, her Habilitation in German, which was to be a critique of German romanticism and writing for a number of newspapers. And that's where she met her first husband, Gunther Anders Stern. She met him at a Marxist ball, uh, which was a fundraiser for a magazine he was helping to start. They were married a few months later and moved to Frankfurt where Anders was trying to finish his Habilitation under the direction a Paul Tillich and a Theodore Adorno. But Arndt didn't care much for the Frankfurt School and it turned out that they didn't care much for Anders. They refused his habilitation and after a year in Frankfurt, they moved back to Berlin. But shortly after the Nazi party started to come to power. And in February of 1933, after the burning of the Reichstag, Hannah Arendt said that she could not be a bystander. As early as 29, she had seen the way the political climate in Germany was shifting. When Bertolt Brecht's address book was confiscated, her first husband fled to Paris, but Arendt stayed behind in Berlin and her mother came from Konigsberg to be with her. 
Together, they turned their apartment into a stop on the underground network to help communists flee the war. At the same time, her good friend, the Zionist organizer, Kurt Blumenfeld, had asked Hannah Arendt to go to the Prussian State Library where she was working on her second book and collect examples of anti-Semitic statements to be sent to world leaders and foreign press offices so that they could let people know how bad the situation in Germany was becoming. At the time, this was a crime called horror propaganda. And after a couple of months of sitting in the library, collecting these anti-Semitic statements from newspapers, magazines, speeches, and journals. Hannah Arndt was arrested, walking out the front door to meet her mother for lunch. A librarian had reported her, what use does an academic have with so many newspapers? Hannah Arendt was held by the Gestapo for eight and a half days. She was held in a basement and interrogated, but she eventually was able to escape by what she would later describe as pure luck. Through her gift for storytelling, she was able to charm the young guard who was standing watch over her and counseled her on how to get out alive. The next day, Hannah Arendt and her mother fled Germany. They made their way through Prague to Switzerland and eventually to Paris where Hannah Arendt would spend the next eight and a half years working only for Jewish organizations. As a young girl, when she had first encountered anti-Semitism, her mother had taught her that when you're attacked as a Jew, you fight back as a Jew. And Arendt said that she only wanted to do Jewish political work. She broke with the tradition of academic philosophy and turned toward the world of political thinking. Over the course of the next eight and a half years, she worked with organizations like Youth Aliyah to help Jewish youth emigrate to Palestine it was there in Paris that she met her second husband, Heinrich Flucher. And like her first husband, Heinrich Flucher was not educated. He had fought on the streets of Berlin with the Spartacus League, and to her mother's dismay, he was not Jewish. But he was her four walls, the passionate romantic love affair of her life, the person who gave her a sense of home and belonging in a century that tried to strip her of those existential goods but their relationship was quickly disrupted. When France entered the war, all German nationals were required to report for internment camps, first Heinrich Blücher, and then Heinrich Blücher and Hannah Arendt. In the summer of 1940, Hannah Arendt was interned in Gers in the south of France for five and a half weeks. It was there that she contemplated suicide. It was the darkest moment of her life. And when the chips were down, she decided that she loved life too much to give it up. And so she was part of a mass escape with 62 other women who had the courage to forge exit papers and walk out the front gate as the German front was approaching. Alone on foot, Arendt made her way across France, looking for her husband, Heinrich Blucher, not knowing whether she would find him. She went to Lourdes to be with her friend, Walter Benjamin, where she played chess and read newspapers, waiting to hear word of Luker's whereabouts for two and a half weeks, and then Montauban. And one afternoon, walking down the main thoroughfare where people bought cigarettes and they were selling mattresses and papers, Arendt saw her husband in the crowd. Fate allowed them to reunite with one another. That spring, Arendt and Blucher were able to secure Emergen American emergency exit visas through the American consulate with the help of Varian Fry, a journalist from New York who was helping forge papers. Arendt and Blucher made their way to Lisbon where they waited for six months before they were able to sail to the United States. They arrived in America on May 22nd, 1941. They had $25 and they did not speak English. That summer, Arendt went to work as a housekeeper with a family outside of Boston, Massachusetts so that she could learn English. And when she returned to New York, she was able to secure a job writing a bi-weekly column for the German Jewish weekly Aufbau, which was a newspaper established by the German Club of New York for recent immigrants. 
It was in that paper that Arendt first learned about the final solution and the death of millions of Jewish people across Europe. When Arendt settled in New York, she was writing for the Partisan Review. She became chief editor for Shock and Books. She was working for the Jewish Cultural Reconstruction Commission. And she was working as an adjunct professor for Brooklyn College, all while she was writing her first major work, The Origins of Totalitarianism. The Origins of Totalitarianism was published in 1951. When Hannah Arendt died in 1975, she was mostly known for her reportage on the trial of Adolf Eichmann. And then in 1982, when Elizabeth Young Gruhl published her first biography for The Love of the World, she made public Arendt's private relationship with Martin Heidegger. But in 2016, the conversation around Arendt began to shift. When Donald Trump was elected president here in the United States, millions of Americans turned to the work of Hannah Arendt to try to understand the rise of a liberalism worldwide. What was happening? Why was democracy, why is democracy in decline? So today I'm going to read to you a bit from the chapter on the origins of totalitarianism from my biography to talk a little bit about the elements that have been resonating with readers over the course of the past several years. Hannah Arendt published The Origins of Totalitarianism in 1951, the same year she received American citizenship. She had begun working on the book in 1941 and finished it in 1949. It is an epic work that stretches nearly 600 pages, offering an account of the phenomenal appearance of totalitarianism in the 20th century. When she began working on Origins, Hitler was dead, but Stalin was alive. And because Arendt was writing in the moment, the shape of the manuscript changed over time. As new information became available about what had happened in Europe and what was happening in the Soviet Union, Origins was the first extensive account of the rise of Hitlerism and Stalinism. It was published during the era of McCarthyism in America. And the American and European right read the book as a testament against the dangers of communism and totalitarianism. And the American and European left criticized Arendt for collapsing Marxism with Stalinism, arguing that Stalinism was a perversion of Marxism. At the heart of Origins is a chapter on the political emancipation of the bourgeoisie in the second section on imperialism. There Arendt discusses the collapse between public and private life which are preceded by the liberation of private economic interest into the public political realm, what today we might call the privatization of politics. Where once businessmen were concerned with their families and private lives, enjoying a life of consumption, they now entered into the public sphere, bringing their business models with them. In this section on imperialism, Arendt details how private business interests increasingly took over the functions of the state because they needed new markets in order that they could continue to grow. She says, businessmen became politicians and were acclaimed as statesmen, while statesmen were taken seriously only if they talked the language of successful businessmen. In order to reach new markets, they needed the support of the government to step outside of the nation state borders. As a result, businessmen slowly replaced politicians and matters of private economy became matters of state. But the principle of unfettered growth that drove private interest was incompatible with the need for stable political institutions. And Arendt turns to the political theorist Tom and Thomas Hobbes to talk about power and the principle of expansion for expansion's sake, which elevates private economic interests to the level of politics. And ultimately this leads to the socialization of the private and public realms, leveling class difference while destroying stable political institutions by doing away with the public sphere altogether. And for Arendt, this meant that totalitarianism makes political action impossible 
because it destroys the possibility for spontaneous action between people. If the power to act comes from acting in concert that is with one another, then isolated individuals are powerless by definition. Totalitarian government rules by terror, isolating people from one another while turning each individual in his or her lonely isolation against all others. The world becomes a wilderness, as Arendt describes it, where neither experience nor thought are possible. One way totalitarianism turns people into isolated, lonely individuals is through the systematic blurring of reality and fiction. And this blurring relies upon the inability to see or think discerningly when people are confronted with ideologies that rely upon spreading fear. Arendt writes, just as terror, even in its pre-total merely tyrannical form, ruins all relationships between men, so the self-compulsion of ideological thinking ruins all relationship with reality. The preparation has succeeded when people have contact with their fellow men, as well as the reality around them. For together with these contacts, men lose the capacity for both experience and thought. The ideal subject of totalitarian rule is not the convinced Nazi or convinced communist, but the people for whom the distinction between fact and fiction and the distinction between truth and false, true and false, no longer exist. Drawn from Martin Luther, Arndt highlights how loneliness leads one down thought paths to the worst possible outcomes, following chains of logic that are rooted not in reality, but the imagination. She writes, under the conditions of loneliness, therefore, the self-evident is no longer just a means of the intellect and begins to be productive to develop its own lines of thoughts. The notorious extremism of totalitarian movements, far from having anything to do with true radicalism, consists indeed in this thinking everything to the worst, in the deducing process, which always arrives at the worst possible conclusions. The loss of meaning in the modern world is characterized by the underlying conditions of homelessness, rootlessness, and loneliness, and it's in the final pages of Origins that Arendt identifies loneliness as the underlying cause of all totalitarian movements. Loneliness, she writes, is the common ground of terror. Whereas isolation concerns only the public realm of life, loneliness concerns human life as whole. Tyranny destroys the public realm of life by isolating individuals and destroying their capacity for political action. But totalitarianism also insists on destroying private life life as well. Totalitarianism bases itself on loneliness, on the experience of not belonging to the world at all, which is among the most radical and desperate experiences of men. The German word that Arendt uses for loneliness is Verlassenheit, which means a state of being abandoned or abandonedness. And in this loneliness, one is unable to realize their full capacity for action as a human being. One is unable to make new beginnings. Totalitarianism destroys the space between people by ruining their ability to think with themselves and their relationships with others. One becomes isolated in one's thinking, unable to tell the difference between what is real and what is not. And in this loneliness is dangerous because it destroys the space of solitude, which is a necessary condition for thinking. Shortly after the publication of the origins of totalitarianism, Hannah Arendt accepted a position as a visiting professor at Princeton University, where she was the first female faculty hire. The following year, with a grant from the Guggenheim Foundation, she began working on her second book, intended to be called Totalitarian Elements of Marxism, which was framed as a follow-up to the origins of totalitarianism. She thought the most serious gap in origins was the lack of conceptual analysis around Bolshevism, and she wanted to take a closer look at the ideologies and methods of totalitarian regimes and the legacy of Marxism. With a fellowship from the foundation, Arendt spent March to August 1952 in Europe, conducting research in various libraries while visiting her friends. Unofficially, she continued working for the Jewish Cultural Reconstruction Commission, lecturing in various cities and taking time for holidays in St. Moritz with her friend at the, and mentor, Carly Aspers. When Arendt returned to the United States, she began teaching and lecturing on Marx. 
in the middle of the McCarthy trials. The chilling intellectual atmosphere did not temper Arendt's work on Marx though. And at the height of the zealous anti-communist movement, she published an article titled The Ex-Communist in which she drew a distinction between ex-communists who switched ideologies, but not ways of being in the world and former communists who understood one cannot separate method and aim. It was no small feat of courage to publish something so bold at the height of McCarthyism as the attorney general threatened to investigate and deport alien citizens for being subversive. But Arendt was never one to shy away from controversy or bow to ideological demands. And it was not until 1956 at the end of the McCarthy era that the US government opened a file on Arendt at the behest of a concerned father who thought his daughter was being influenced by her teaching. Mr. X advised he felt that Hannah Arendt was very dangerous to the best interest of this country in view of the fact that she is a professor who travels around the United States instructing at numerous colleges as a visiting professor. He stated his daughter changed her thinking completely after taking courses from Hannah Arendt at the University of California, Berkeley in 1955. The FBI determined that the nonspecific complaint did not warrant an active investigation. Arendt received an invitation to give the Christian Gauss seminars on criticism at Princeton University in autumn 1953, making her the first woman to do so. The faculty and students were delighted to have a female professor for a change, but she was annoyed that she was treated as the token woman. And she expressed to her friend, the Zionist organizer, Kurt Blumenfeld, at the closing ceremony, and ever so slightly tipsy, I enlightened these dignified gentlemen about what an exception Jew is. And I tried to make clear to them that I have necessarily found myself here as an exception woman. Arendt had no interest in being the exception woman, just as she had no interest in being the exception Jew. When Princeton University offered her the rank of full professor a few years later, she threatened to decline because the New York Times stressed the fact that she would be the first woman. Arendt wanted to be acknowledged for her thinking, not for her character traits, which were mere facts of her existence. And she felt she held firm on this line over the course of her career. When she was interviewed about her appointment, she told the interviewer, I'm not disturbed at all about being a woman professor. I'm quite used to being a woman. Thank you.